Hello and welcome once again to the BV Magazine podcast, your genuine slice of rural Dorset life. It's autumn, the clocks have gone back, so that can only mean this is October, episode two. Hello from me, Terry Bennett. And hello from me, Jenny Devitt. Coming up in this episode of the BV Magazine podcast... James Cossins tells us about the challenges of bringing in the harvest this year. Steve Farrell of the Eight Arch Brewery Company tells me how he successfully brought back brewing to Wimborne after a gap of nearly 80 years. Best-selling author Victoria Hislop takes on the challenge of the random 19 questions. And Kath Abbott of North Dorset's basket-making Cradle to Grave tells us of the success of their woven willow coffins. But first, here's Jenny's interview with James Cossens. Farming all over the world is a challenge, and this country's no exception. In an article for this month's BV magazine, farmer James Cossens writes that this year's harvest has been one of the most difficult he's ever known. Rain, unsurprisingly, being the culprit. I think mainly because of the the weather situation that we were in, uh, we had a very sort of dry sunny June and we thought hello yes it's all going to look look good and once we got into sort of mid-July when crops were sort of ripening and nearly ready to harvest um, it started raining and we didn't really get any consistent dry weather during the second half of July or August and it just meant the crops needed drying to help them on their way um, to the store And the storms we got just kept battering the crops closer and closer to the ground. So it meant that the combines were having to work that much harder to try and pick the the straw and the grains up away from the ground. They weren't flat on the ground, but it just made life a bit challenging. Last year, we were really spoiled. Uh, It was really hot, dry throughout the whole of harvest. And we didn't have to dry anything. And we just kept going. Um, and it was all good. The only issue last year was a potential risk of fires on machinery. This year, totally opposite. Um, so it was just very, very frustrating. And you, there weren't many days when you had a full day's combining on. Let's say, you know, you'd start mid-afternoon and we'd sort of finish when it was dark. So it was just very, uh, very frustrating. When you say you had to bring your crops in for drying, is that just air drying or do you have to put some heating on? Yeah, we have to <laughs> Yeah, we had to put some heating on, which um we have sort of two systems of drying. We have what I call a, a continuous flow dryer. So you, you put the grain in the top and then it's got um some like say hot burners which run on um diesel. Um that sort of puts hot air on the grain and then out the bottom comes the dry grain and obviously you can adjust the flow and the temperature to get it right and um, what comes out of the bottom the other system we use is on a like a floor a big ventilated floor and we use um like a color gas burner to provide the heat and then we we blow air through it and we also have like a like a stirrer um, um and that moves through the crop mixing it all up um and it's a well, I think it's a better way of drying or quicker way of drying the crop using less energy. But of course, drying, yeah, drying all these crops is not not cheap. And um, at harvest time, you've got to decide, do we wait till it is dry or do we go ahead and dry it, even if we've got to dry it a little bit? Um, of course, you all get a bit twitchy when your neighbour's got his combine out and you think, oh, yeah, perhaps we should get ours out. But most of this year's harvest, we had to dry Apart from the last, we we grow beans, spring beans. And yeah, when we got to them in September, we had that nice bit of weather and they were dry. But of course, the fact, James, that you're having to use fossil fuels to dry the crops eats into your income, doesn't it? And it's also polluting. Well, yeah, not not good for the environment. Yes, I mean, if if we could avoid drying, I obviously I would. But when you see your crop deteriorating in the field, you've got (laughs) a bit of a tough decision to make. Um, yeah, so we, you know, we don't want to lose the crop, so we just have to go for it and um, and dry it as a small amount. So if the rain keeps beating your crop closer to the ground, that makes it harder for the combines, as you say, to lift it up. Yes, they do have what they call lifters on them, a sort of metal device to to pick them up. Um, and I think the other issue was the 
as, as the rainfall kept coming, that the quality of the crop could deteriorate. We, we grow quite a lot of what we call spring barley um, for malting, i.e. for beer making. And one of the key key sort of parts we want with the spring barley is that the germination should be near enough 100%. Um, normally it's about 98%. And the, the dear sort of barley seed thinks, Christ, if, it's, if I'm nearly ripe and it keeps raining, it's time for me to germinate. And then if it starts to lose its germination, the, the molsters won't won't need it because they can't sort of use the germination in the uh, in the brewing process. So we had to cut some a little bit earlier than we thought we wanted to, and sort of dry it. And fortunately, it's just about made malting, um, and there is a considerable premium for malting barley over feed barley. Um, so it was important to sort of try and keep that, and and the wheat again. Uh, for, for sort of bread making is what they call the hagberg which is like the the doughability of the the wheat it's important not to lose that or again that the, the millers will reject it so it was a bit of a race against time to get the crops in before the um the cereals deteriorated too much james it it is a wee bit ironic isn't it that there you are being offered a better price to sell your barley to the breweries than for feed it being rather more important to eat than to drink alcohol uh, well, yes, there is. I haven't really thought of it that way, but um, I mean, there's probably a, a sixty to seventy pounds a ton premium for malting, and it's quite a sort of special, well, not specialised market, but a, a limited market. Quite quite a lot of it in the south gets exported out of Poole and Southampton, mainly to Europe, and and the feed barley generally it would go to to feed animals rather than humans. Let's say um, you know, humans would generally eat wheat, as in sort of bread and um, biscuits and that sort of thing but yes i think it, we, we just got to look at the priorities and it and i think that's the thing with agriculture at the moment uh sort of got mixed signals from the government what we should be doing um they brought out a new scheme called the sustainable farming initiative where they'll pay you perhaps to not grow crops or to leave margins of, of grass or wildflowers around fields or even not grow a, a crop at all, um, they will pay you for sort of like a fallow mix. And we sort of think, well, yes, we still need to produce food, but it's just getting that balance right between looking after the environment and producing food for it so everyone can uh, survive, as it were. It is a tricky one, isn't it? Because the UK is only, isn't it, uh, some 50% self-sufficient in food. So if you're setting land aside that's non-productive or to be non-productive, then we're even less independent in our food production, aren't we? Well, that's right. I mean, I think the sort of direction of travel is, yes, most farmers w will not, let's say, set aside or fallow their best land. Um, but as margins get tighter financially, in other words, if it's getting more expensive to produce the crop because of fuel costs, fertiliser costs, etc. And if we're getting less and less f for growing the crop or return on, on the what we sell, it does make you focus your mind a little bit. OK, and if the government are offering you know, so much a hectare for growing these sort of legume fallows, uh, lays, it sort of almost thinks, well, actually, should we go farming? You know, perhaps we should look at rewilding and, and not produce the food because you know we're only doing we have to make a profit at the end of the day um to reinvest into our farms and if we're not doing that you think well why do we put all this extra work in to do it so it's it's getting the fine balance and at the moment prices of cereals are not are nowhere near where, where they were last year um fertilizer prices for next year are sort of creeping up we have bought a lot of what we need next year but of course it needs paying for fuel prices seem to sort of quietly creep up the last few months um and so it's becoming more expensive to to grow the crops and we're not perhaps getting the return and we're also into dairy production uh and our milk price is possibly not really sustainable at the moment i mean we're on about 37 pence a litre Back in Christmas, we were nearly up to sort of 50, 52p. And we think we virtually need probably 40p to break even um, so that we can do some reinvesting in our in our system. So I think we 
yeah, the dairy industry is, is certainly under a lot of pressure, um, and we need the price to to go up, not dramatically, but go up just at least we can break even. Because otherwise, you are effectively subsidising the middlemen of the supermarkets, aren't you? Well, well, that's right. And okay, maybe last autumn, winter, when it got to fifty p, we thought, well, no, perhaps you know, I'm not going to say we could be too much, but it, perhaps that was uh, higher than what was sustainable. And and I think there was a certain amount of con- consumer resistance, or they say that consumption dropped a bit. Although talking to a lot of people, they don't actually know what the price of milk is in the supermarket. They just use it as a, you know, we need milk, so we buy it. And um, they c- can't necessarily tell you what price per litre it is. But it, it has dropped back in the supermarkets. But I think I think we need, yeah, to be pushing for a little bit more just to um, see that there is a future at, at the end of the tunnel, as it were. So why, James, your grain prices, your crop prices lower this year than last year, given that you had a better crop last year? I think it was it's sort of the, the world supply and demand. I think last year with Ukraine and what was going on, there was concerns. Were they going to, because they were, Ukraine are a, a big exporter of wheat and sunflowers and maize, etc. Um, were they going to be able to get their product out into the world market? Because um, if they can't, that would then create a shortage in the world. And the sort of economics of supply and demand, when um, the demand is higher than the supply, the price goes up. And I think that's what happened last year. Now, they've sort of, I wouldn't say they sorted themselves out, but they have managed to export a fair bit out of Ukraine, um, either by road or by, by boat. And, and the world is, is more of a level sort of balance on, on supply and demand. So, yeah, it's probably dropped 50, 60 pounds a tonne. But what we'd like to see is that, you know, has, has the price of bread come down in, in in supermarkets? Well, I'm not sure it has. And you think, well, they're sort of getting cheaper grains now, um, the, the millers and that. Surely there should be some adjustment on price. But it, it's because we're in a world market. Um, it's not just what we do in this country. The, the, the price is... is has come down and they you know we i keep the people we sell grain to i said oh is it going to go up and they said well we're not really competitive enough on the world market if we up the price um because the likes of russia and other countries all all supply the wheat on the world market and they're not going to buy it from us if our price is higher and um, aside, James, from all this juggling act that you're faced with every year, you in the farming community have also to cope with an increasing volume of obligatory regulatory paperwork or computer work, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I've just had a – in my article I did write about that because I was um, – we, we had a, a red tractor visit. So all the products that we produce, the, the milk, the beef uh, and the grains and the oil seeds – all have a like a red tractor sticker on it so say that it's all met a certain standard and the consumer can guarantee that you know there's uh, good good welfare standards for animals that storage of the grain is, is up to a very good standard and so the consumer can buy that with confidence that it's 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 a well-produced product we then had the food standards agency who came out to check the dairies they can actually come out without any announcement so that took us by surprise so we we got through that and there weren't any particular major issues. We supply our milk to Arla and, and we're on a what they call an Arla care contract. So we're sort of a, a gray, we, we graze our animals. We're on a sort of higher wel- high welfare contract. And in order to get that, you do get inspected quite a lot. And then we had the Rural Payments Agency audit where somebody came out and walked all the fields, checked that we had the right distance between the center of the hedge and the crop you've got to have two meters as part of your cross compliance um thing but by your hedges checked all the footpaths they checked that we hadn't spread manure in places that we shouldn't have they then go all, through all, all your paperwork um any pesticides or chemicals that you put on crops they want to check all that any medicines that you've used on animals to, to check all that and and to give you a you know a, a thorough audit Um, Because we do claim from the government this basic payment scheme, um, an area payment. And I suppose, yeah, justifiably, is public money being given to farmers to look after the land. And periodically, 
we, we get inspected. But I mean, that's um, <laughs> that's just how it was, and it just seemed during harvest, or seemed to be <coughs> seemed to be a lot going on. We're also part of our milk contract. We do a climate check, so we got it, which is a bit of a measurement of how efficient we are on the farm, uh, and they're looking at your inputs, your outputs, and how efficient you are, and how you're sort of. I'm not sure we're quite into the carbon side yet on it but um they're looking at efficiencies and we get paid a little bit extra if we reach a certain number of points on our sort of climate check thing so that's something else but yes there is a lot of paperwork and yeah we get through it and it does when someone comes to do a, an audit like it, whether it's you know for the our, our butchery or our the, the the pub and that it does put you a little bit on edge as to um what they might find or what they're what they're looking for but it's um yeah we still i still enjoy farming it's all a challenge every day every day is different and um it's nice being out in the, the fresh air outside working with the elements well that's very nice to hear now james i read just recently that the biggest headache for british farmers is not the impact of covid nor brexit nor the economy but the great british weather do you agree with that <laughs> Um, yes, I think it is certainly one of the biggest challenges and we, and I think the weather forecasters do keep saying this, that we seem to be going into extreme sort of weather patterns. Um, I mean, like last weekend, you know, here in the South, I don't know, it was probably up to 23, 25 degrees centigrade, really, really sunny, you know, marvellous people out on the beach and all that. And then you look at them up in Scotland and they were sort of having nearly a month's rain in one day. Um, and you think if we had that in the south here, we, we, we'd be certainly jumping up and down. Yeah, it just seems that the, the more extreme weather patterns, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure they say it's climate change. And it was, I think, September, one of the months was one of the hottest uh, months on record. But I think we yeah, obviously we've got to work with the weather, whether it means we go slightly different crops. You know, if we get really wet autumns perhaps we should grow more spring crops if we can't sow them in the autumn the frustrating time is when it's harvest time and you want good weather and you you don't have good weather and all that hard work and all that expense of growing the crop and then you sort of see it deteriorating or some of it left in the field but we we've got to work with it and i don't think yeah we, we just got to work with it and be flexible in our sort of management systems many is the time when i think who'd be a farmer that was James Cossins, who farms not far from Blandford. Best-selling author Victoria Hislop answers the random 19 questions. Even if you've not read one of her books, you've no doubt come across Victoria Hislop's name on a bookshelf or heard it in a chat about Goodreads. Victoria wrote The Island in 2005, inspired by a visit to Spinalonga, the abandoned Greek leprosy colony, and was named Newcomer of the Year at the British Book Awards. The novel became an international bestseller, with more than 5 million copies sold worldwide. She is renowned for drawing the reader into the rich and diverse worlds of the Mediterranean. In her second book, The Return, she wrote about the painful secrets of Spain's civil war. And in her third novel, The Thread, Victoria returned to Greece to tell the extraordinary and turbulent tale of Thessaloniki and its people across the 20th century. The Sunrise, set in Cyprus, and Those Who Are Loved, which tells the story of Greece's traumatic period of occupation and civil war during the 20th century, were both number one bestsellers in the UK and Greece. Victoria is now an honorary Greek citizen. Her books have been translated into more than 35 languages and have been bestsellers in China, Greece, France, Israel and Norway, as well as in the UK. This month, Victoria headlines at the Dorchester Literary Festival with The Figurine, her latest book inspired by the story of the Elgin Marbles. Born in Bromley, Kent, Victoria studied English literature at Oxford, going on to work in publishing and journalism after graduation. As a journalist, she wrote on education and travel for national newspapers and magazines. As well as studying the Greek language... It's her ultimate ambition to read everything and anything without the presence of a dictionary by her side. Victoria spends her spare time reading, swimming, dancing and boxing. While recovering from breast cancer surgery in 2021, Victoria agreed to be a contestant on Dancing with the Stars, Greece's version of Strictly. 
she gained celebrity status in Greece following the success of The Island when the book was made into a hugely popular television series, To Nisi, by Greek channel MEGA. This month, she told the Daily Mail that the rigorous demands of the intense schedule helped enormously in her recovery. It made me regain the sense of self I'd lost in those months after diagnosis. Today, I'm a show-off at any party where there's a chance to dance, and I've embraced a new fitness regime which includes boxing. It demands the greater level of fitness I managed to achieve, and the footwork is reminiscent of dancing. Victoria is known not just as a writer, but as a storyteller, allowing her readers to dive into rich history from a very personal perspective, making the past feel incredibly present. And so, to the random 19 questions. What's your relationship with Dorset? For a decade, we... That's Victoria and her husband Ian Hislop. ...had a cottage near Sherborne and went there every weekend until our children were around four and six. The landscape was beautiful and we used to go for long walks with them in their small wellies. And we went to the Tutankhamun Museum in Dorchester so many times. They were magical years. The last film you watched? Oppenheimer. I went to the cinema last Sunday with two friends. We were the only ones there. I thought it was spectacular. Brilliant script and acting. And so many people thought it was too long. I thought it was too short. It was totally enthralling from beginning to end. What would you like to tell 15-year-old you? Don't worry. One day your hair will be less frizzy than it is now. A nice man called John Frieda will come to the rescue. Tell us about a sound or a smell that makes you happy. The smell of oregano, either fresh on a Cretan mountainside or just from a packet when I bring it back to London. What was the last song you sang out loud in the car? I sang along with Lady Gaga to Always Remember Us This Way from A Star Is Born. I have decided it will be my next karaoke choice. So I'm learning all the words too. What book did you read last year that stayed with you and what made you love it? My Name is Lucy Barton by Elizabeth Strout. It was so original, with such a clear voice, so true and so real. I absolutely loved it and wept at the end because the relationship it describes is such a painful one. I haven't stopped reading Lisbeth Stroud since. What's your secret superpower? Skipping for ages without a break. My skipping rope always travels with me. Your favourite quote? Books give a soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination and life to everything. That was from Plato. I really don't think it needs any explanation, does it? It's simply true. It's Friday night, you have the house to yourself and no work is allowed. What are you going to do? I watch Gogglebox and if there are some repeats, then I watch those too. I think it's a piece of genius to watch people watching television and listen to their conversations. It's funny and heartwarming. If I run out of Gogglebox, then I try and find some celebrity Gogglebox. What in life is frankly a mystery to you? Junk food. It's expensive, unhealthy, doesn't fill you up, smelly and uses masses of packaging. So it creates litter and mountains of rubbish, encourages obesity and diabetes. Why are people allowed to abuse their bodies like this? Everyone pays a price in the end. Chip shop chips or home-baked cake? Home-baked cake. Any day. Especially if it's still warm. It's a massive treat. What would you most like to be remembered for? Revealing some of the dark reality of modern Greek history. What was the last gift you either gave someone or received? I was given a bracelet with a Matty, the evil eye, by my publisher on publication of The Figurine. Tell us about one of the best evenings you've had. My 60th birthday. Myself, Ian, our two children and four very close friends all went to Crete for a few days. On the evening of my birthday, we were in my favourite taverna in Plaka, that's opposite Spinalonga, and I sang along with some local musicians. What is your comfort meal? Beans on toast, with lots of marmite under the beans, and HP sauce squirted on the beans. Cats or dogs? Cats. All my life. I've never had a dog. What shop can you not pass by? Boots. There's always something I need. What's your most annoying trait? Insisting on ridiculously early arrival for a flight. It's fine when I'm alone, but very annoying for a travel companion. 
If you have the power to pass one law uncontested, what will you do with it? I would ban smoking. Everywhere, all the time, for everyone. Today I'm speaking with Steve Farrell, who's the owner of the Eight Arch Brewing Company. Have I got that right, Steve? Yeah, yeah, Eight Arch, yes. Yes, and that's named, I believe, after the bridge, is it, in Wimborne, where you're located? Yeah, it's the bridge leading out from Wimborne to heading towards Corf Mullins, the Julian's Bridge, which has got eight arches, yeah. Thank you, first of all, for, for speaking to us on the BV Magazine Thanks. podcast. Now, no this this business is not, as many people would imagine, happens in the brewery line of business. It's not handed down to you through the family. You're the the yeah. first in line here. What? Tell us the story. How did it come about? Well, it was around 2012. I just moved into my new house and had the first time I had a garage. And I, I've said many times to people when I, they've asked me, what got you into brewing? I have no idea. No idea whatsoever. I can't, I, it's probably just to make cheap alcohol for myself at home um and uh, yeah you know that is where it all started you know I, I didn't have any previous um brewing experience so it was, it was you know I'm starting from a clean slate and it was just a case of doing research online you know the first stop was for anyone who knows it is the, the extract kit so it's just a massive tin looks like a massive tin of dog food um from the outside but then you open it up and it's just the malt extract so it looks just like thick maple syrup you know really really thick that you just warm up slightly so it comes really liquefied stick it into a plastic fermenting bucket sprinkle in the yeast and uh, add some water and you let it do its thing um so that was the starting point you know and with those first ones then you learn how to bottle and how to condition the beers in the bottle um testing it on friends and obviously they were all saying how good it was with squinted eyes and not really liking it and like, i'm there thinking to myself you know yeah this is really nice but deep down no this wasn't very good so i quickly um escalated that into learning how to do all grain which is the process and what we do now again it's just a case of researching books internet and just learning the process through that and i moved on to a 50 litre kit doing the process um i won't bore everyone with the how it is but you know it's, it's the malt um with water at the right temperature um and then you ferment it and add the hops and yeah away you go from that that is the basis of where it all started okay it's one thing doing it in your garage and getting interested and uh, learning a bit more about it but it's a it's a whole new ball game bringing that to a business so what made you make that leap because you were a, an hgv mechanic weren't you yeah, that's where I started. I was, um, when I left school, I mean, my parents had the transport company um, when I left school in 2000. And um, I wanted to go out, well, my dad wanted me to go out and get a job. And I just fancied doing mechanics. So fortunately, I got taken on as an apprentice mechanic. Um, I was there for seven years. I did the MVQ two and three in HGV mechanics, Izuzu master technician. Um, and then I, I, it just felt like the right time to go over and work with mum and dad at the transport company. And at that point, we were the the distributors for Hobbycraft in the UK. And, you know, it was great, you know, really busy. We were only a small company based in Poole in Dorset. And, um, you know, we, we, it was really, really good. And then at one point, Hobbycraft were bought out. And that at that point, it was 95% of our business. When my dad started the company, it was the transport industry was very different at that point. And by the time that Hobbycraft were moving their distribution away from Blantford up to uh, Burton, the, the game had changed pallet networks for anyone who knows the pallet networks. They had taken away all of the business of what started my dad's transport company back in um, the early 90s. So we took the decision that we'd, we'd close the company. And obviously, by that point, I'd been bitten by the brewing bug. I'd, told I would be bitten by and it was you know I had job job offers to do transport management uh, but I, I'd set my heart on doing the brewing and it was just the the process of getting to the point where I would scale it up. Okay and you you took that leap a bit of a leap of faith but sort of slightly forced upon you by the circumstances with the company but what are the complications of setting up a business like that i mean it's one thing setting up a a corner shop i guess where you sell <laughs> particular range of products and you yeah. go and buy them at the uh, wholesaler and then you you sell them on but you need a lot of technical knowledge to become a brewer it's also quite a specialist market isn't it i guess there's quite a bit of regulation around it as well there's simple sides to it and there's complicated sides to it you know i, I was coming into it a certain degree blind obviously never being in the industry but at that point so when i was obviously 2012 when i started brewing there was the whole craft beer boom happening and there was a lot of breweries appearing you know in all different places so it wasn't like i was 
something new completely out of the blue it, it was already happening yeah I, I was very fortunate that my wife she worked with someone who um this lady called hillary her husband richard worked in worked for courage for many years he was never in the brewing side of things he was all, all on the business side of things and the the managing of pubs etc and my wife said to me um do you want to have a chat with him and i was like, yeah okay fair enough so we met up one evening never spoken to him before and we basically i just laid out what i wanted to do and he just said to me you know right we'll go away you get the facts and figures of you know the costings and what we can sell things for i'll look at the other side of things and and see if we can meet in the middle and if the numbers don't work then i'll tell you not to be so stupid and walk away fortunately the numbers worked um well we believed they would work and at that point i started doing the training courses um up at brew lab in sunderland um you can do homebrew courses there or you can you know do the higher forms of commercial brewing etc so i went on like a four-day course up there to um learn you know the planning of like what you'd need in a brewery the licensing side of things the um hmrc side of things and i was fortunate enough to meet up there one one of the guys who was talking up at the course he was uh, a former head brewer at fuller's uh, brewery in london he was there doing a talk about the planning of a brewery and the tax and side of things but he also supplied brewing equipment so i got talking to him and he was the one in the end who supplied our equipment and supplied virtually all of our equipment that we've got here. So, you know, a brief overview is that it was a case of finding a, a premises. I'm from Wimborne. I'm Wimborne born and bred. I wanted it to be in Wimborne. You know, I did a lot. Of, it wasn't just a case I'm going to start a brewery. I did a lot of back research into it. And the Priest House Museum in Wimborne were very kind to me and allowed me to go into their records and sit up upstairs at the museum and go through previous brewing records. So I did a lot of back research on it on that side of things. And I was very focused on yeah, bringing it back to Wimborne. Yeah, it, it sort of escalated from there. We found the premises on Stone Industrial Estate where we still are in Wimborne. Got planning, you know, or, ordered the um, equipment. And yeah, and then the scary start of things started to happen. And I did think that sometimes I did think to myself when, you know, when the equipment did arrive, what am I doing? I'm going from 50 litres to 1,000 litres and I've got to try and sell this now. So it was a bit of a scary step. Well, you brought brewing back to Wimborne after I believe a 78 year gap um, hmm. because Ellis and Sons were the previous brewers all that time ago okay you've got this brewery ready to go how did you know who your customers would be or how do how could you have been sure that there actually were, were customers out there well you don't you don't that's the thing and for people who don't know the, the you know the beer trade or the the pub on trade side of things you know there's an awful lot you, you'll see pubs they they might look as free houses, et cetera, but, you know, just to name a few, you have like the Green King, Marston's and places like that. You know, a brewery like us, we can't sell to them because they're tied. You know, we have to look for free houses and independent shops, et cetera. So it was just a case of, right, do a bit of research, find out what were the free houses, the place that we could approach. Just speaking to them. And, I, I, you know, I did a bit of work before I physically had the brewery. And I went and spoke to them and said, you know, I'm going to be doing this. Would you be prepared to try it, et cetera? And they were all welcoming. You know, uh, we've still got a lot of customers that bought from us on day one back in 2015 are still with us now, um, which I mean must mean the product's half decent, I guess. Independent breweries are a small percentage of the overall beer sales in the UK, but there's actually quite a lot of them, isn't there? There's about two and a half thousand, I think, now. Yeah, I, I don't know the official numbers as it stands now, but I, I know at, at one point there was around two and a half thousand. Whether that's slightly dropped off now, there have been quite a few, especially over the last 18 months. I, I think COVID had a big effect on uh, people because obviously it had an effect on a lot of people, but you know we were fortunate to come through it. But you know, there are there definitely a lot of smaller breweries out there, but compared to the you know, the the bigger boys, you know, whether you're gonna talk about beer such as Carling or or you know, Heineken, those type of, of breweries, we're a tiny, tiny percentage, you know, and, and just us, you know, we're we're just a speck on the sheet compared to those. You know, you get a lot of breweries saying, you know, we fight the bigger war against them. We're not like that. We you know all we want to be, we just want to make good beer, we want people to enjoy it and to be a successful business basically. Uh, Steve, I've got to confess that I know nothing about beer at all. I don't drink myself. but I won't um, hold it against you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm guessing possibly that you have a bit more free license to go and try out particular ideas and produce 
niche beers would that be fair to say that's uh, that some of the yeah. bigger breweries wouldn't do yeah absolutely we we've we've done quite a lot of it i can't off the top of my head we've probably done an, in excess of 100 different beers over the almost nine years that we've been brewing by being like we are we can do whatever we want to a degree but then you've also got to look on the side of it that it needs to be sellable as well um because you don't want to brew at this wild and crazy beer and not be able to sell it because at the end of the day it's all about sales also we do like to experiment and you know we haven't done as much of that over the probably the last 18 months two years because of the demand for our core beers such as square logic the pale um so that you know that takes up a lot of our brewing capacity um but we did were fortunate to be asked by the local brew dog bar um earlier this year they each year they do a collab fest they choose a local brewery to brew a beer with them for the collab fest so we did one we got asked by brew dog bournemouth so we've done a 5.9 uh strawberry milkshake ipa um uh, and just before i started talking to you i was just because it started the collab fest started today actually so i was just looking on untapped which is a beer scoring thing online and yeah our beers in rotterdam it's in malmo in sweden and everywhere so it's good promotion for us but yeah we don't get to do it as much as we'd like to really a lot of your market is is local, isn't it? You used to export, but not so much these days. Is that correct? Yeah, no. We the, all of the exporting side of things, we we never went searching for it. Found us. Um, the first one was in Italy, and we've done Sweden, Switzerland, Norway. But you know, obviously, being a small brewery, and going back to a point you made earlier about who we um, sell to in the local area, those are the ones that got us started in the first place and you know it was all great having these different customers from across europe coming to us wanting our beer obviously it's great to think that you know people in different countries want our beer but we was you know getting so getting bogged down with these orders that we were almost didn't have enough for the local area um so we decided that you know i made the decision that you know we need to pull this back a little bit we need to focus more on the people that got us where we are now and lead on from there and um yeah, it, it, it's worked. And, you know, ever since COVID happened, um, it, it's not a a thing that we intended on doing. But, you know, our sales radius has shrunk and our sales have gone up. So, yeah, we, we've got a great reputation in the local area, definitely. And what about your raw products? Where do they come from? Uh, well, the malt is all, well, I, I'd probably say pretty much all of it is British. We buy from a, a company up in the Midlands. Um, they supply us with our malt, our hops, and we get yeast from different suppliers as well. Hops predominantly are American. They all come through the UK supplier. Um, we use a sprinkling of English hops, sprinkling of Australian, New Zealand, and a little bit of German, but it's mainly American. Um, again, I won't bore people with the details, but the American hops, they are the, the features we want out of the hops is what we get from the American hops. You know, you get the punchy tropical flavors, citrus flavors. English hops are great. You know, if you have like the best bitters and et cetera, they, they work a treat in those uh, type of beers but for the beers that we're trying to produce we want that punch of hops and the flavor coming through and you can only get those from american and southern hemisphere hops really fair enough and you've been doing this now for eight years i mean you're annoyingly young you're not 40 yet are you but, um well yeah. almost i'm going bold as well so it, but, it's coming yeah but it's going well obviously because you're about to move to larger premises i believe yeah, literally just over the road, our current premises, we've been in, I, I took the premises on in August 2014 and started brewing in January 2015. So, you know, it's escalated from there. Um, so it will be our nine years early next year when we commence brewing. Um, and at that point, we'll be in the new premises, which is literally just over the road. So currently we're in the premises around three and a half thousand square foot. And the, what we're moving to is seven and a half thousand square foot. So a lot bigger premises. We're not going to be getting any more brewing equipment. You know, we think we can utilize our current equipment a little bit more um, from moving over there. But yeah, it's, it's going to be exciting times. A lot of hard work at the moment. And just before I started talking to you, I'd spent three hours pulling raw plugs out the wall. So yeah this is the enjoyable part not <laughs> living the dream as they say absolutely and what's what's the plans for the future then i just want people to keep enjoying our beer as uh you know as much as possible you know going to these new premises with our where you know where we are now the the tap room we have open every friday 3 to 8 p.m you know we will be opening more when we're over there we haven't finalized those times etc at the moment but it'll definitely be fridays and it'll definitely be saturdays and you know just Hopefully more people come enjoy the beer uh, and, we, and we keep 
keep pushing forward and you know we're, we're not looking for world domination you know we're not looking for being in every pub on every corner of the uk the main thing is that you know we want our beers one thing i've always said i want our beers to be consistent you know you don't want if you if someone finds a beer that they really enjoy they don't want to then go uh, two weeks later go to a pub and then see it again and it is completely different you know i've always wanted our beers to be consistent and enjoyable approachable and they are uh, you know i think that's a key thing that i want to keep going forward and probably people will think that the type of beers we make are perhaps for a younger generation um of drinker but you we, you know we don't make a best bitter we do parallels and we do ipas and a kolsch which is a large ale hybrid uh, but you could see if people would come and visit our tap room you know the broad age range of people that we get down here we get you know 20 year olds up to 80 year olds or even higher so i think we we appeal to all crowds even though we might not be making the traditional sort of style beers steve whatever you're doing keep doing it it's, it looks like it's going really well and thank you for thank you. talking to us today no problem at all appreciate you contact me thank you in these increasingly environmentally aware days, more and more people are wanting to bury their loved ones in properly biodegradable and non-harmful coffins made of materials like native-grown willow, for instance. In their workshop in North Dorset, Kath and Tosh Abbott make not just traditional and beautiful willow baskets, but they have a range of different designs and colours of willow coffins. Kath told me that she's been weaving willow for over 20 years now and says that she loves the idea of planting their own trees, watching them grow, cutting the branches and turning them into beautiful objects. But how do her hands cope with working with such tough materials? I've always used my hands in work ever since I was a youngster and I've always done land work, um, you know, and I've always worked with plants and we do a lot of canvas sewing as well, so that's something else we do. And I've always woven baskets. So my hands now, after probably about 40 years of doing various different jobs with my hands, um, they're getting very arthritic and painful, um, <laughs> which happens to all us basket makers, unfortunately. I'd like to think I could um, be weaving for another sort of 10, 15 years, maybe longer. <laughs> And over the years, Kath, you've had a variety of different spaces in uh, which you've woven your coffins. Yeah, well, when I very first um, started weaving, I actually used to live on the road and we used to travel about with horses and wagons. So I learnt the craft there and um, we used to sell the baskets on the side of the road. So I, I always used to sit outside and make them. And then in 2000, um, I moved into, the, um, into Dorset and we basically rented a house and gave up our lifestyle to concentrate on our business so then we started making coffins and I've the very first place I had to make the coffin was in the front room of the house and then in a very small garage um, and then we moved into a yurt in the back garden a 20-foot yurt so that was a good workspace um, and now finally we've managed to um, buy a bit of land and we've um, got planning permission for workshops here so we've got a lovely big 20 foot by 40 foot workshop now where we make all our products and store our willow and yeah it's great. <laughs> so you're a, a very flexible and adaptable person then? Yeah I always have been I've just kind of gone with it got, gone with the flow all, all throughout my life and one thing's kind of led me to another and um, yeah and we're here now in our workshop weaving willow that we grow ourselves and when did you first get the idea of making coffins from willow well the first time i ever saw one was at my late mother-in-law's funeral and she had been buried in a cardboard coffin and when i went into the little office on uh, the, it was a green burial ground there was this picture of this coffin a willow coffin and i saw it and i thought oh wow that's amazing and a lot of people had also asked me previously, oh, do you make willow coffins? And I always just said, well, no, I don't. We just do baskets. And then in the end, I thought, hmm, hang on a minute, this might be a good idea here. Um, so basically, it took a couple of years to find someone to teach me. And eventually we found a lovely old basket maker in Great Yarmouth called Terry Bensley. He's, he's since retired. Um, and he taught me how to make the coffin. To, it did take a couple of years to get get it right, but um, yeah, so that's how I learnt, got the idea, and learnt to make them. 
Is uh, making a willow coffin more challenging and difficult than uh, making a willow basket? Yeah, they are really, because it's not something um, like a lot of the baskets I've made. I've kind of just worked it out myself. Um, but with a coffin, um, I did think that it's something that you need to be shown how to do by a professional, because obviously they're going to be holding weight. The handles have got to be weight bearing and they've got to be built to do, built to do the job. And of course, they're much more environmentally friendly than your standard wooden coffin, I imagine. Yeah, well, they are, absolutely, because um, your standard wooden cheap coffin, they're either made of, the really cheap ones are just a basic ply board, but the um, veneered ones, they're, they're made of like a MDF. Of MDF wood full of glue, so the most unenvironmentally friendly thing you can think of, um, whereas our coffins are 100% natural and bio, biodegradable, and we make them from the willow we grow in our field, um, locally chopped hazel that we get ourselves from up the road. And so the only thing we buy in for our coffins, really, is the um, fabric we use to line it, natural cotton um, calico, and the sisal rope that we use for the handles. You don't use any metals or plastics? Nothing at all like that. It's all 100% um, biodegradable materials. I understand, Kath, that you grow something like 18 varieties of willow, all uh, native subspecies? There, well, actually, we've got over 25 now because it, cause, um, every year I manage to get hold of some cuttings of a, a really lovely, amazing variety from from another grower. So, um, yeah, we've got about 25, maybe more, different varieties. It's all basketry willow and they're just all... They're all different colours, so you get many shades of green and there's brown and orange, yellows, reds. Um, there's a lovely one called Welsh White Willow, which it isn't white, but it's a very light bark, like a yellowy sort of white colour. So, yeah, you can get some amazing colours these days. So there are no artificial colours? They're all natural colours of willow? Yeah, well, the willow with the bark on is um yeah they're just it's grown in the they're just different varieties and the bark happens to come out in different colors so we have got a little bit of dyed willow here that we sometimes just like to add for a bit of color and it's used it's all natural dyes that we use to dye the willow with um but otherwise yeah we mainly use our homegrown natural willow of course, the lovely thing about willow is it's very fast growing isn't it yeah it is well this year for example a com- this year and last year, so the comparison was last year it was really hot and um, quite a lot of our willow we ended up having to, we couldn't really use because it was hadn't grown well enough. Whereas this year, even though it's been raining, our willows absolutely loved it, to be honest. And um, it's probably each willow plant you probably get, once it's established after about three years, you probably get anything from 30 to over 100 shoots on each plant and um, they all grow different lengths. So some of them are three foot and some of them are about 10 or 11 feet high, depending on the variety. So each winter, as soon as all the leaves have fallen off, we cut it back at the base, at the, right down at the base and um, just bu- put them all the different varieties in bundles and then we sort them into, grade them into different heights so you get your three foot, four foot, five, six um, feet, so on um, and then it's all just ready to store, dry out and store and then we can start using it. Now out of those 25 that you're growing, which willows are best for coffins? Well, my favourite willow um, that we grow is called Brittany Green and Dickey Meadows there's some lovely names of the different varieties but they are both green varieties green coloured bark and they just grow really tall and slender and um, luckily well especially the Brittany Green if the weather's you know if we do have a bit of a drought it still is it still grows long enough um, you know we get good enough lengths to use for the coffins. And which ones are the easiest to work with? Yeah, that's a good question because some of them are quite tough. The Dicky Meadows is definitely one of my favourites to weave with and the Brittany Greens. Um, we've got another one called Flanders Red, which is a um, like a orangey red colour. That's That can be quite hard to use. And we've got one called Harrison's Purple, which is really lovely. It's kind of um, has flecks of purple in it. So that's quite a nice one to use as well. So, yeah, they're all different. I had no idea that there was such a natural colour variation. Now, 
One of your other endeavours is making Viking ships at small scale from Willow. They are um, like a Viking ship Asher, and so we've been making them them for about six or seven years now, probably a bit longer actually. Um, they're very popular in the States. There seems to be a lot of Viking ancestry over there, but they're, they're quite expensive to post. But this year they're, they're starting to pick up in the UK, and we've had a few orders from people in the UK. Just a, another idea, isn't it? It's just a nice way to get rid of the ashes, and it, and it gives the family a, a reason to have a really nice ceremony as well to get any orders from Norway we've had one believe it or not but I think about 90 percent of our boats go over to America and these are actually designed so that you set fire to them yeah they're about a meter long and you get like a little ash basket that you put in the back of the boat and you just literally fill them up with kindling and small little logs and um, yeah you can just gently push them out onto a calm sea or a lake or a river and um, yeah set them on fire and have a proper little ceremony. This is Tosh's department isn't it making the mini Viking willow ships? Yeah that's right well we do everything together pretty much but yeah it it was kind of an idea that we we both had Um, we both love the the whole Viking thing. I've always loved the idea of being pushed out to sea on a boat and being set on fire I mean what a way to go so obviously you can't do that with um full-size boat with a real you know with a person in there so um having a miniature version is the next best thing (laughs) Kath I gather that before the advent of plastic a lot of things were packaged up in willow baskets so this ancient craft kind of went into decline didn't it around about the middle of the last century are there signs that it's recovering now I think so I mean um People don't like using disposable things as much these days. We, we're starting to sell a lot of shopping trolleys as well at the moment. So um, we've, we've, been, we've been making these beautiful, brightly coloured shopping trolleys and trying to encourage young people to have them as well because obviously shopping trolley associated with old ladies, but that's just not true. So um, And they're really useful baskets and they'll last forever and you can put quite a lot of weight in them and they're on wheels and, you know, you can just... Let it trundle along behind you with all your shopping or um, young people can use them for college and, you know, put all their books in and take them, take them to college or they're very useful baskets. Um, so, yeah, I do think more and more people are buying shopping baskets and, you know, storage baskets. And are you managing to persuade young people that this is what they need, a woven shopping trolley or book trolley? <laughs> We're trying our best to, yeah. Um, we have a lot of interest in people um, wanting to come on workshops as well and learn to weave. So that's something else that we, we do as well. I imagine your business is doing rather well these days, given that an increasing number of people are turning towards green and eco burials, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, that's right. They are. And, um, you know, once one member of the family is um, has been laid to rest in the green burial site, they generally you know the rest of the family think it'd be nice to have a a plot there as well with you know next to their loved ones so um they're lovely places because you can you can have your funeral there and bury your loved one and then it's they're, they're generally really lovely places where you can go and sit there and just you know have a have a bit of peace and quiet and just enjoy the the, the scenery and all the, the lovely things in nature and um yeah go and visit your loved one I'm sure, Kath, you're not thinking of giving up any time soon, especially just having won this major national award. Will your children take over eventually? That's the plan. Once we've got a bit more money coming in and we can afford to pay one of our daughters, definitely, yeah, because, you know, we can't do this forever. So hopefully in the next couple of years, once things have settled down a bit here and, you know, we've our willows all established and we can get hopefully get a few more orders in. Yeah, it'd be lovely to think that we can take on one of our daughters and um, train them up and then they can help. And that major award I mentioned was gold in the Good Funeral Awards for 2023. That was Kath Abbott and she and her partner Tosh run Cradle to Grave in North Dorset. And they have a lovely and very detailed website. So if your thoughts should be turning to environmentally friendly willow coffins, have a look. I have to say, they're really lovely. Jenny speaking there with Kath Abbott. And on that slightly sombre note, we end this edition of the BV Magazine podcast. We hope you've enjoyed it. Join us again in November. 
Until then, it's goodbye from me, Terry Bennett. And goodbye from me, Jenny Devitt.